Hello, members. Welcome and good evening, one and all. Uh, I'm so delighted that you are all here to join us. I'm also extra delighted that my husband is cooking this evening and he's currently downstairs preparing my meal kit, which is always exciting. Um, I'm Anna Spooner, one of the tastings and events coordinators at the tastings team at the Wine Society, for those who haven't met me before. And I am delighted this evening to be joined by Cyrus Rustam Toddywalla, OBE, and his wife Pervin as well, who is helping him out this evening in the kitchen and on all things tech. We are going to get through a lot tonight, so I'm going to give you a small introduction on how the event's going to work, a bit of technology, and then I'm going to introduce Cyrus. So um, first things first, please do use the chat to give us your thoughts on the food and wine tonight, if you've got the pack, or perhaps just the wine, just the food, or anything else you might be drinking tonight. Um, please also use that Q&A button to ask questions. We're going to be jam-packed during the session to ask too many questions, but hopefully we'll be able to answer some as we go, or alternatively, we'll have a little bit of time at the end to answer some as well. Um, I have mentioned it in the, the email you'll have received, but if you want to get the best experience, we believe this evening, we suggest viewing this event in gallery view. So you have the two screens side by side once Cyrus pops up. Um, there, there are instructions of how to do that on the email if you haven't already done so. Um, any tech problems tonight, please email tastings at thewinesociety.com. We have Gil and Tim tonight behind the scenes helping out, so they'll be able to answer any woes that you may have uh, or any questions or conundrums. Um, and then I suppose the last thing for me to do is to welcome Cyrus. So Cyrus, are you there? He was just here a moment ago. Here he is. Lovely. Good evening, the, uh, Cyrus. Put and video ready. Hi, Anna. <laughs> Hello. Hello so it's my pleasure to welcome Cyrus tonight. Many of you may already know him or recognize him from the likes of Saturday Kitchen, etc. Um, but before becoming a celebrity chef, um, he has been the proprietor of many restaurants uh, in both India and the UK. He's been awarded uh, his OBE in 2010 for services to the restaurants and catering industry. Um, and has a huge passion, I know, around training and education and, and certainly has loads of um, values aligned with the Wine Society. So for me, he's far more than a celebrity chef. Uh, that, that just wouldn't possibly do him justice. And uh, not only that, produces incredible food, um, fusion food, Portuguese, Indian styles that we're going to taste some of this evening. Um, and what's more, just... Uh, the cherry on top of the cake has been incredibly accommodating today and uh, due to unforeseen circumstances is actually dialing in from his own kitchen, which is a great rare treat. So Cyrus and Pervin behind the scenes as well, um, a huge welcome and thank you from the thank Wine you. Society and on behalf of our members. So thank good you. evening. Hello everybody, Anna, I'm on day release. You're on day release. <laughs> Cyrus has been in A&E today. So uh, he's... Like, like some of our prisoners at the Clink Charity. I'm on day release. <laughs> but anyway, everybody, welcome and have a fabulous evening today. It took a bit of time to get through all the wines to pair with the food that we are giving you tonight. I hope you read the instructions and your oven already has the batatas muros inside. So a couple of things we sent in extra. We did send you little toasted fingers of olive bread. Okay, and so that you can eat that with your, uh, you can have that with your hummus. I know I recommended you have it something that way. But enjoy them. They are marinated in an olive oil dressing with lots of herbs in them. So they are a bit greasy, but they do pack a nice punch. The, and the other thing that is extra in your boxes is this bag of risotto. I told Anna I'm going to give them a surprise because just in case you still feel hungry halfway through or three quarters of the way through or tomorrow, that's a veg vegetarian risotto, but cooked with coconut milk. So it's very different, it's lush, it's creamy, and it's very gone, gone Portuguese, whatever we call it. And the wine today, that's the most important thing actually, and the pairing of wines, because this is something that goes back many years of trying to figure out what wines would accompany our kind of food. I worked with several wine experts to understand where we should go and what we should do. And the first one, the Pinot Gris, is probably one of my most favorite grapes. I just love it so much because it's dry, it's fruity, 
it packs a punch and it and it actually accompanies many other foods it can it doesn't necessarily have to just go with fish or chicken it goes with every other food that you want to eat with it so that wine well chilled of course anna will go through that wine more and she will tell people i like it slightly more chilled simply because i let it air in my glass it's against the wishes of most wine experts but that's me because i still like it cold as it's as is receding into the glass and enjoying it your first course the batatas muros which I, which i have here it's steaming hot they're a bit over crushed so please forgive us because after packing them we had to mix the dressing inside and they get a bit over crushed but they are absolutely superb they are very very popular in our restaurant in buckhurst hill in essex and um we sell oodles of that it is it is uh, the batatas muros if you go to uh, portugal is a little bit different we have created a dressing that blends very nicely into the potatoes and that gives a little bit extra hint okay the goans did learn to eat a lot of olive oil thanks to the portuguese who brought it over and then they got used to eating with olive oil this is during the portuguese regime they are still hooked on it and they will pay a lot of money to get olive oil in goa which sometimes is a little bit more difficult to get hold of so this is nothing but baby potatoes blanched then we crush them and you can actually grill them or deep fry them till the skin becomes crisp so we did that and then we packed it for you with the dressing with that of course you got this hummus this is coming on our menu and this is portuguese hot chorizo with a few spices inside and cumin of course there is tahini inside and it's been pureed the chorizo is diced and very very slowly cooked under pressure so it gives its oil off but doesn't become hard and rubbery and that is then blended into the hummus to give it that extra flavor and color and of course you have these bread sticks so if you enjoy them just dip in and enjoy and wow oh, sorry i have to eat some myself you're enjoying yourself cyrus the problem is going to finish the lot no i'm worried that i'm going to eat it all i thought she would eat it all just before we even started <laughs> sorry <laughs> oh thank you for that explanation cyrus and um i should tell members now as we're going on to the first pairing we did this one slightly differently to how we normally at the wine society we normally work which was a real treat for me cyrus which was you said anna you can't change your wines i can adapt my food so you requested that i send you a selection of wines i thought would work and then you picked your wines that you wanted and then you edited your your recipe accordingly so you've really been the the puppet master of this whole operation but it's the best way it makes it makes sense because indian food is complex and so is the indian influence on other foods so when we come to the main course i will explain that as well but uh, <clears throat> because you have to add certain things to to make the indian palate enjoy it and that means the wine has to blend in nicely and it is difficult when someone says yes uh yes your food i'm going to pair the wines i have difficulty with that so you don't understand the complexity of my food but i can understand a little bit about the complexity of your wine and the chef's palate dictates me to understand what flavors i want to present with that food so this is a lush creamy rich buttery wine is 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 probably one of the greatest wines from alsas and uh, this one is hand picked so it makes it extra special and um, i think it goes very well with the food that we have got you for your first course i think so too i've i've just tried it with both dishes and i have to say that it's brought something different in both um with the um with the chorizo dish which obviously has a little bit more spice etc and i would say some more smokiness um i found the wine much fruitier and with the potatoes that have a sort of more herbaceous note i found the wine um not quite so fruity um but but sort of i don't know almost more smoky so it brought out these two different elements um and i will quickly just talk a little about the wine and then we can talk a bit more about um talk a bit more about how you feel the pairing went cyrus but okay. you're quite right the the texture from this particular wine which is the kumu uh hand harvested pinot gris 
And it's from New Zealand, but quite rightly, as um, as Cyrus has said, it's made in an Alsace style. And the reason we can tell that is they're calling it Pinot Gris rather than Pinot Grigio. Um, it's the same grape variety, Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio. Um, but here, by calling it Pinot Gris, they're nodding to the Alsace style. And what do I mean by the Alsace style of Pinot Gris? Well, they leave it a little bit longer on the vines. So uh, the grapes actually get more, more richness and more content um, sort of from a flavor point of view. So here we're getting more of a peach and stone fruit flavor. Hopefully you might get a touch of floral. And Cyrus, you mentioned about allowing the wine to warm up in your glass. For me, that floral flavor will come out the longer you leave it. Yes. If you leave it there, you'll get those. Yeah, you'll get those kind of more like jasmine, maybe maybe um, sort of white white flower notes. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've mentioned this creaminess, and and that comes from lees, and lees being the dead yeast cells um, that are that are redundant after the fermentation, so they've made the alcohol. But what they do here uh, to make this wine is they, they stir in the lees very regularly. And that lees adds not only flavor and that tight, slight touch of smokiness, but also texture. And I think you're right, it does give almost like a mouth filling creaminess. So for me, all of those sort of things that you've picked out are perfect because that's exactly how the wine is made. Whew. That makes me feel better. <laughs> because I, I'm I'm not the one to say it. I get I get smell of peach and lavender and this and that. It has to appeal to the palate holistically, and I think that's what makes the big difference with this wine. Of course, New Zealand produces amazing wines, not necessarily always the cheapest of the lot, but they do produce excellent wines. And this is very very much an Alsatian style, because the Alsatian style you'll get your you'll get the lace, you'll get the you know, the fungus on it is very typical because the winter comes in hard and harsh and dry. And I think that's what the wine is so popular for. And exactly. personally, I love it. I know I can't drink it tonight because I'm on antibiotics, but I'm only going to have a few sips and then the boss lady can finish it off. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I bet you're happy about that, Pervin. Very happy, Anna. Very happy. <laughs> I'm Good going to be stuff. a happy girl tonight. <laughs> Good. So um, a quick bit about where this wine is from um, and a tiny bit more on how it's made, because Cyrus has alluded to a few more of those things. Um, so like we've said, it's from New Zealand. It's from near Auckland, um, which is in the North Island of New Zealand. And obviously being Southern Hemisphere, that means it's slightly warmer than places um, perhaps that are on the South Island. What I would say is uh, there's still a decent amount of ocean influence. So it's, it can grow red grapes, but it's not a warm, warm climate. Um, and it's not as fashionable as places like Marlborough and Martinborough. But Michael Brakovich is an MW who started Kumu. And um, he has basically pro proven, proven that um, Auckland can produce incredible quality wines. Um, so... Yes, he, he produces this very specifically, though, like we've said, in a Pinot Gris style rather than a, a slightly more um, diluted or less intense Pinot Grigio that would come from northern Italy. One of the ways they do do that, you mentioned it exactly earlier, Cyrus, they hand harvest. So they choose the best grapes yep. and they sort them. They get really quality grapes. And then with those hand-picked bunches, what they can do then mm -hmm. after that is put the bunches in the fermenter or in the, I should say, in the press. And when they press them before they ferment them, um, because they're whole bunches, the stalks create these drainage channels. And the drainage channels allow the lightest juice to run through. So you don't have to push really hard. You get this beautiful light juice. And instead of pushing against the skins, which would give you sometimes a bitterness or a, or a, a phenolic or tannic feeling that you wouldn't want. Instead, you get this beautiful lightness and you get the light best juice. Um, so for me, it's got, as you mentioned, it has got a sort of lavender, slightly herbal floral note to it. Definitely all those peaches and those flavors as well. Um, and it's creamy without being overpowering. And I think it's been perfect for these, for these two starters. Um, I should just ask, we've had a question. Um, Cyrus, would you be able to just clarify what, what the flavor is in the potatoes, which, which herbs you used? Uh, so I used tarragon, parsley, coriander, garlic, mustard, chives, and thyme. 
And of course, of course, garlic. I did mention garlic, and they're all pureed together, and it's almost made like a mayonnaise. So as the as the things puree, we pour the oil in very gently, and it forms a thick body, and that then becomes a paste, and we chuck the paste, and we just blend it inside. They can make it at home. It's simple. Or call for it from Cafe Spice. One of the two. <laughs> well, it's really delicious. I think. Um, I think for me. It's sort of one of those dishes that you can eat all year round as well. Yeah. And um, that the other thing I would say is you mentioned it earlier, the wine is very similar to that. It can be a summer wine and a winter wine. And for Absolutely. me, both of these dishes are really good at bridging. You could eat them in the summer, but they're perfectly delicious in the winter. One question um, for me, Anna. Yeah. Now, some of these wines you notice often get tartrates inside. Have yes, you the crystals. This particular wine. So, um, yeah, tartrate crystals um, that Cyrus is referring to, members, are um, tartaric acid, which occurs naturally in wine. You can also add it, but it, can, it does occur naturally as well. It's just a, a type of acid. Um, and what can often happen is um, once uh, it's almost <laughs> some people call them wine diamonds, which I kind of love. <laughs> um, but it's sort of the equivalent it's not quite but it's sort of the equivalent of um, well to an extent it's almost exactly the equivalent of uh, sediment in a red wine and so if you do ever see them in the bottom of your glass usually it will be the last glass of, of a bottle but it's not always sometimes if you particularly if you've been moving the bottle around they'll come out and it's just a sort of sediment that sits in the bottom of the glass yeah I don't did you say you didn't have any Cyrus or you did oh I haven't got none no, I haven't got any either. Yeah. Um, so you'll probably have, they may have filtered them out. Um, some okay. people don't filter them out. Um, but I, I mean, I haven't got to the bottom of the bottle, so I can't guarantee for sure. If I had got to the bottom of the bottle, we'd be having an interesting, <laughs> interesting event here. Um, but uh, yeah, members, if you do ever see those, please don't worry about them. Um, it is just a tartaric crystal. Um, I mean, don't make a habit of drinking loads of them just purely because it's it's not something you're supposed to consume a lot of, but it certainly won't harm you. So don't worry about it. Um, and yes, a lot of um, a lot of white wines, as I mentioned, tartaric acid will occur naturally. And then in other white wines, it um, can be added depending on where in the world. And those tend to be the ones that have lots coming out the bottom because they've added a lot more than is naturally occurring. So yes, um, but no, you're quite right. And it's a beautiful color, this wine. I do love it. Um, members yes. who are joining along um, this evening, I've obviously poured all of my wines. That's purely a uh, logistical choice. <laughs> um, but in terms of, if you do have the red, feel free to pour it if you want to. Um, Sheena's just asked, should the red be chilled as prescribed in the pre-email chat? No, um, I would take the red out. You can pour the red now if you want. Um, also, we're about to go on to the next set of instructions, which will include pouring the rosé. But what I would say is that if you are tasting along this evening, I haven't tried it yet. And it's going to be really cruel because if you've finished your hummus, but I have a sneaky suspicion the hummus might go really nicely with the rosé as well. Um, but I would encourage you to keep, if you can, please keep a glass of of, um, of your Pinot Gris because it will be fun to try that wine along with the other dishes in the evening. Cyrus has obviously gone to a huge amount of effort to make sure that the exact pairings match up, but um, please do feel free to keep the wines. We love experimenting here at the Wine Society. So if you want to keep a glass and try on, try some other combos, then we, we encourage it. We encourage experimentation. Um, I will... <laughs> I'm going to finish with a fun fact for you before we, we move on to the first break to allow you to prepare the next course. And my fun fact is that Michael Brakovich MW, who started Kumu, or Kumu River, I should say, um, up in Auckland, he was the first ever master of wine from New Zealand. So he became a master of wine in 1982. Um, and funnily enough, we're topping and tailing with masters of wine on this evening's event. Not on purpose. It was a complete accident. But um, he was the first ever from New Zealand in the 80s and uh, has been producing wine from there um, for a long, long time now. Um, and if you do like the like this style, this sort of fresh but rich, he also produces some incredible Chardonnay in the same style. And we have done a virtual event with him before. So I'll in, in my follow-up email, I'll include a link to that so you can go and watch it and learn a little bit more about his winery. 
So without, oh, perfectly, as if by magic, we're going to um, stop the clock, as it were. We're going to have a break now. And I think we've got a break slide to show you, members. This break will allow those with the meal kits to um, clock off. Um, it will allow you to prepare the second course. So the Mung Dal Samosa and the, um, you're going to have to pronounce this one for me, Cyrus. It shines the camera there we go. <laughs> um, they they are in the same the same pack, but please do follow the instructions that we've sent. Um, we're going to see you back here in ten minutes, which okay. means that we'll see you here at eight o'clock, everyone. And please, please, please do pour the Tavel, uh, the Cuvée Prima Donna Rosé from Domaine, maybe, which I already have, luckily, in my glass. And we'll see you here in ten minutes. Please feel free as well to use the chat and, and carry on talking amongst yourselves, should you wish to. Um, and yes, happy, happy drinking and happy prepping.
Hello, members. Welcome back. Uh, I do hope that you've managed to get the next courses sort of prepared. I can see Pervin and Cyrus scurrying away there. I should also mention, just before we kick into this, if you are near your kitchen and you haven't done so, we have asked you to increase your oven temperature up to 220 Celsius once you've cooked your samosa and your soy that I can't pronounce. The reason being you need a slightly warmer temperature for the next preparation. So uh, please do do that. Um, and then Cyrus, we will yes, let you take it away explaining these lovely dishes. Okay, so just to come to these two, one is absolutely Indian and one is Portuguese, but with a go twist. So it's quite a popular Portuguese snack item called Resha is the Camarao. Resha is, is the foldovers and Camarao is prawns. And with that are these lovely mung dal samosa, they're mung lentils. They've been soaked and cooked and then uh, filled into this short crust pastry, which is very North Indian style. But the samosa is very Hyderabadi style. So it's from the southeast coast of India. Very, very popular. I have to tone the heat down. If you keep it normal, it'll blow your head off. <laughs> but that, that state of India really is very hot food. The little sachet that you have got is a date and tamarind sauce. That's the dip for the samosas. So just tear it, squeeze it out, and then dip your samosa inside and eat it. That's what it's for. The rishnois need nothing except that. <laughs> and of course, we, we are doing that with a rosé. Extremely favorite of ours at home. For easy drinking, we do like our rosés a lot. Because rosés, from years and years of trying to pair food, are the best for anything spicy. They somehow seem to just work across the board. So you don't have to change your wine. You don't have to modify it. If you have a good rosé, it will help you throughout your meal. But preference is Languedoc style rosés because that's the preference. I think they are not just fruitier, but they are richer. They have a characteristic that really likes hot, spicy food. And I think we, we just love them. So this one in particular is really fantastic. Again, you have a fancy looking bottle. So it, it's, a, it's a great combination. And filling of wine. Sometimes, Anna, we were talking about red wines. Sometimes it so happens that if the wine has high tannins in my mind, a red wine, I chill it down slightly and then decant it. And it allows the tannins to just soften up just that little bit more. Because if you are pairing a great red wine with Indian food, you could be making a mistake. Even if the quality of the food is great, you could be making a mistake. And for that particular reason, if you want to enjoy a great wine, this is my personal view. And I've done it in various events that we do. So just tone it down slightly and then let it grow in your glass. It's just beautiful. So samosa, mung bean. I mean, I'm not biting it. It's very, very hot. But you can bite into it. The rishois is... Uh, Prawns cooked in a creamy sauce with spring onions and garlic and chili and a tiny amount of cumin. We have this old-fashioned water paste, which is, uh, yes, the old-fashioned water paste, which is, again, we may say it's very British, but it's very Portuguese as well. This is not the time for a history lesson, but Britain and Portugal have been allies since the 1400s. So we are obliged to protect Portugal even today because the treaty has never been annulled. And this goes back to the 1600s when Britain, when Portugal discovered India and Britain was desperate to get a foothold in India, like every other European country, the crafty thing that was done was Catherine of Braganza was married to Charles II and as dowry, the islands of Bombay, Basin and Salset were handed over for trade to the British East India Company. And that's how the first foothold of the of Britain landed up in India, but it's thanks to the Portuguese. And of course, that led to many other things, which is for another occasion. If people will get bored because it can just go on in, on a history lesson. But um, mung dal. So why the mung dal with this particular wine? Mung dal becomes lush and creamy. It cooks very rapidly. So it becomes very dense. And you need to cleanse your palate with something that is dense. So if you bite into it, It is dense, 
but I must cleanse my palate for the next morsel that I'm going to eat. The Rishon is the Kamara, is creamy, it's lush, it's already creamy, which will match perfectly with this wine. I think you're right about that density, Cyrus. I've, I've, there's something I've learned recently over the last few months, and chefs say it, and sommeliers and wine tasters don't say it enough. And it was a recent um, event we had with a, with a master sommelier who said, think about texture. And I think chefs think about texture and food, with food and wine matching far, far more than, than we do in the wine trade. And you're absolutely right. This texture works. The Mungdal texture and the texture of the kind of slightly tannic rosé, exactly like yeah. you say, a little bit of tannin, but not, not a red wine but, tannin, is, is amazing. But it still has a nice warming feeling, that wine. There's a lovely warmth about it. Because when you eat that samosa, it's going to stick to your upper, uh, the cleft of your palate. And you want to take it down nicely without destroying either the samosa or destroying the wine. And I think that's most important because you can't destroy either. The Rishma is the Kamara, of course, is uh, lush and creamy, so it's great. It is not, um, it doesn't need very much thinking behind it because it's got very little spice. The cream, the creaminess brings out, doesn't bring out the chili as much as the chili would come out in the samosa. I love those pairings. I really do. Um... Oh, what a what a what a contrast! But what two really really lovely, um, different dishes that work well so well with the wine in two different ways. Yeah, totally um, different, we've also had a member say that the rosé is going well with the risotto, which they've obviously they've joined in for this course. So I haven't done that. I'll have to save it for later. So I want to try that. Um, and somebody another member. Somebody is more hungry then. <laughs> Someone is more hungry. There we go. Um, and another uh, member has also said that the um, the tamarind sauce goes really well. Oh, no, sorry. I apologize. Uh, they're saying the rosé goes well with the course, but what's in the tamarind sauce? How's that made? Uh, that's <clears throat> lots of tamarind, raw cane sugar, chilies, cumin, etc. We put a host of spices, cook for about 10 to 12 hours, and then it's pureed through and rested. It will never spoil. It's one of those things that will last for months together. It won't spoil but it, it, it's one of uh, India's most common accompaniments to fried snacks. Because tamarind, the acidity in the tamarind is not that elevated that it will affect your wine. So, and some people make a very, very sour tamarind uh, sauce, which would clash with this wine. Ours is more lush and it's more thick. It's full bodied. So it will help with the, with the wine. It will just waft, I mean, what do, I can't get the word, but you know, just <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good point to make, actually, Cyrus, about acidity in food in food being a real challenge for wines, but in particularly wines like this. Um, to give you a bit of context, this wine doesn't have as much acidity as the first, and actually, quite honestly, both wines are not what I would call a very high acid wine. They're not a Riesling, and they're not a sort of a very young Sauvignon Blanc, for example. But they, so they both have slightly lower acid. And I think actually um, that hasn't affected the fact that they're fried. I was a bit dubious thinking, oh, because often you hear people say fried snacks need high acid wines. Not in this case. There's enough, enough sort of crunchy red fruit that you feel refreshed and you feel that palate cleanse that you've mentioned. But it's and it's not cloying, um, but it's not sort of sharp. Um, and they're both quite. Yeah, they both marry quite nicely because of that. The important thing is that the samosas are not greasy, not oily. And that's what the difference between fried foods is and very oily, greasy fried foods. Because the oil coats your palate at the same time. And that destroys very much, I think, some of the better floral notes of good wine. If the, if the oil is very strong inside. Absolutely. Here, you don't have that. So I'll give you a little bit of an, a, an intro into this, this particular wine. Um, so we've mentioned already a lovely design label on the bottle, uh, yeah. but it's uh, by Domain Maybe. It's their 2020 and it's the Cuvée Prima Donna, which is their top Cuvée of Rosé. It's from a 
part of France called Tavel in the Southern Rhone. Now, if you saw the bottle and you thought, I would never drink a rosé that colour because it's going to be sweet, then you wouldn't be um, the only person to have thought such a thing. And there is a style of wine called White Zinfandel that is particularly this sort of beautiful electric strawberry colour. And it comes from the US and it is sweet. Um, darker colour does not mean sweet. And I'm sure most members will know that, but I can never shout, it about, shout about it enough. Um, the way where this particular wine is made in the Southern Rhone, it's the only rosé only, sorry for the mouthful, um, Appellation in the whole of France. It's just over the uh, river from Chateauneuf de Pape. And actually, a lot of people say Chateauneuf de Pape does not produce a rosé because it doesn't want to step on Tavel's toes. Um, so this is kind of the big boy of the rosé world, should we say. It's dry, so there's no sugar, but it is fruity. And for me, it's things like red currants, watermelon, strawberry, but with a lovely herbaceous and mineral note as well. So it's not swimming pool rosé, as it often gets. You know, there's definitely two schools of rosé gastro rosé or gastronomic rosé and swimming pool rosé and this is most definitely a gastronomic rosé it's produced from almost um i wouldn't say identical at all a geologist would kill me but very similar terroir to the chateau neuf de pape so it has those huge pudding stones that radiate heat um it's made from two of the great varieties that go into chateau neuf de pape it's sanso and grenache um they both add freshness but sanso in particular adds freshness it's old vines, uh, 50-year-old vines. They tend to do um, a job of concentrating the fruit. As they get older, they um, take up less water and they take up various behaviours. Their roots have dug down, so they keep well, but the fruit is more concentrated, a lot of people say, on the old vines and often more complex. So this is the top, top, top cuvee. Um, it's actually produced in stainless steel, um, so it's not aged in oak. Quite rare to find roses aged in oak, although there are some examples and you can find some examples in Tavel. This one is a stainless steel one. And I think that for me, Cyrus, is another reason that it goes so well with the food. Because a, a lot of the time you can get these incredible roses. Um, Spanish often can do them, dark roses that have been aged in oak and oak can add tannins. And I don't think we really want tannins for these kinds of dishes. Where there's a bit of spice, sometimes the tannins can't play very well. And it's not a coincidence that Cyrus selected low tannin red wine that we'll go on to in a moment. But it kind of means that you still get the refreshingness and the structure actually comes from highlighting the acidity rather than, than there being too much tannin. There's a touch of tannin, but it's it's a natural thing from a red grape rather than um, rather than oak or rather than long maceration um, on the skins. Uh, and it will age for about 10 years. So it's not a it's not a drink it quick and drink it with ice cubes kind of rose. It's quite the opposite. Um, you might find as well, and Cyrus, you've already mentioned it about letting it breathe in the glass. You might find that this particular wine, again, can carry on to the next course because yes. it's quite robust. It's got enough going yeah. on um, and most definitely a, a, a gastronomic rosé as opposed to a, a whimsical one. You made a very important point there, Anna, and people ask me these questions all the time. The worst enemy for Indian food sometimes is heavy oaking. So people used to always claim that a shabli goes well with Indian food, actually not. Because you destroy a perfectly great wine and you feed it with food that it cannot match. Because good Chardonnays need oak and good Chardonnays don't match with Indian food as much. Unless you have the lighter, fresher, fruitier versions. Which is why I like this wine very much. Because when it sees oak, it gets those tannins that start to affect the side of your jaws. And that makes the food less enjoyable and makes the wine less enjoyable. Something goes wrong with spice and oaked wines. Yeah, they tend not to be good partners. So, it, it, okay. yeah, it certainly wasn't a surprise to me. And obviously, I didn't send you anything particularly oaky, but it wasn't a surprise to me that you you chose things that had a very low tannin, um, tannin structure. Uh, we've also had one member say that the Pinot Gris is standing up really well with the samosa. So that's great it to will. hear. It will, it will. Um, just before we go on to our next um, break, because I'm conscious I've right overrun a minute, but Cyrus, could you just confirm how to heat up the risotto so that members could do that on this course if they choose to? I think one of your guests already has. It'll work fantastically in the microwave or put the pouch into boiling water for 10-12 minutes. 
reduce the uh, water from a boil. If you do what is called sous vide, take it to a rolling boil and leave the pouch inside. Uh, let me check the pouch one sec. Uh, and while Cyrus does that, members, just to give you the heads up, we're about to start the 15 minute break to prepare the third Sorry, course. Just oh, one yep. thing, Anna. Yep. These are biodegradable pouches, so you can put them in your food compost bin. Fantastic. So they, they only take temperature up to 70 degrees, which is good enough. So okay. keep the temperature up to 60, which is hot enough for food, and then it will stay well in the bag. Otherwise, it might just burst a bit. Okay. Okay. So some Perfect. of the pouches that are used tonight are biodegradable. So perfect. It's so it's sous vide or it's on a on a on a low heat or it's in the microwave. Yes. Or microwave. Perfect. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, members. Right. We're going to probably overrun slightly. Um, so what I'll do is I, the next slide does say come back at 830. But if you're 832, we won't mind because I've run over a couple of minutes. So see you here at 832. Ignore the 830. Um, and the, the instructions as to what to do next will be on your screens shortly. And see you then. Have fun. Cheers. Cheers.
જમશીદ ના જે પ્રિન્ટ છે ને મને નથી સમજ પડતું કોઈ વખત everyone welcome back um i hope you managed to get everything done in time my husband who is uh, a, a guinea pig for the evenings like this has managed it so fingers crossed um welcome back cyrus and hello hi now i've actually done the risotto in here as well um oh, good. i have i have just had a mouthful of the vegetables first and i have to say i'm very excited to hear about them so i'm going to hand straight over to you um and we'll get cracking with this course and then i'll go on to the wines are the wine afterwards thank you how would you pronounce that grantaxa well it's actually granache well it's yeah. garnacha but um obviously it's in chilean rather than than spanish, spanish. Um, okay. so yes granache but garnacha would be the spanish and and therefore this pronunciation you already said why i chose that wine because it is low on tannins it's nice fresh refreshing and it's light body so even though normal grenache is normally quite heavy and can be strong this one doesn't fit that bill it's just nice i just like it very much because it's very uh, how would i say it's very uh, welcoming but let me come to the dish i'm not reheating the food because we are not going to eat we had some food earlier the vegetables i think they are best you heat a frying pan peel the film back chuck it in your frying pan toss it a couple of times and they'll be done oh you done that fantastic but now coming to this this dish has a history and i thought we'll bring it in it's not portuguese gone it's british indian so it's one of the earliest forms of uh, fusion between indian and british food it came about 2 300 years ago when in the gymkhanas or the clubs the cooks wanted the officers to eat more indian food but they would be more resistant and so they started to cook food british food with an indian twist so this is the indian uh, country captain is the indian shepherd spy it's called country captain because it was in a country club first person to eat it was the captain and they called it that way and it stuck that way now for me when i was asked to cook for her majesty's diamond jubilee lunch to set up the diamond jubilee parade in 2012 and the palace asked me what will you cook i said i'll do a fusion but it's got to be lamb or mutton and it's got to come from a particular source and the vegetables will come from high grove of course everything didn't work out to plan but the lamb did the mutton did part of the mutton came from the island of north ronaldsay which is the outermost hebrid uh, orkney island and part of it came from lord newbury's estate in north wales in a town called corvan and these two were married because the north the north ronaldsay lamb has no fat on it it probably 2% fat which isn't ideal for cooking down very slowly so you got to render it very carefully before and it's very strong scented because it only breeds on uh, kelp and seaweed so it's very high in iodine okay so that was what we created we cooked for 440 people on that afternoon so the glorious day 29th of march 2012 the reason i had to do it because being a chef i'm also a deputy lieutenant of greater london and so her majesty is my bigger boss in one sense though i report to the lord lieutenant the lord lieutenant reports to the queen or the sovereign and uh, but we are all committed to serve her majesty in that sense so it was only uh, since i was on the committee as well it became essential that i should host the first lunch and that's how it happened so there isn't any egg in that mash because it's it didn't sound right to send it out to people with egg in the in the mash so your coloring might not be as rapid as when you put egg yolks into the mash okay the original recipe had egg yolks so do get it nicely colored if you can put it under the grill get a nice color we'll make sure the contents are heated up nice and through inside and then 
enjoy it because what we do is we render down whole shoulders and with spices and we cook them very gently then we strip the meat off and that is then packed into this uh, into this dish it's a uh, very popular it's one of the most popular dishes on our menu as well so i hope you enjoy it but that wine now that wine actually works very well when the mash comes into your mouth and then underneath you get the lamb which is little bit more spicy and little bit more flavorsome and it helps you just build it all together i put quite a bit of pepper crushed pepper in the mash eh, just to elevate the aroma when it comes out of the oven and that should help you with the wine as well because i think that kind of a that kind of a spice uh, smell invigorates the pituitary glands and you salivate it a lot more which helps you to enjoy a good classic wine like this I agree. Um, I have to say that is really delicious, Cyrus. Um, what a treat. Uh, and, and, and that lamb is, is falling, you know, falling apart. It's beautiful. Um, and quite rightly, we've spoken about texture already, but that soft, could almost creaminess, it's so soft, the lamb, goes really well with this wine, which has that lovely, soft, voluptuous, easy texture. So it's gorgeous. And some of the flavors you've mentioned, I'm not surprised you picked a Grenache because Grenache is famous for having a pepper note to it. You've mentioned the pepper um, and also a spiced and aromatic note. Um, you touched on a moment ago the fact that some Grenache can be really big and bold and absolutely. And, and where we just were for the last rosé in the Southern Rhone, famous for gutsy Grenache. Um, and funnily enough, I did an event on Tuesday when I was talking about the fact that Grenache is sort of around the new world being made in a more interesting style that's more akin to a Pinot Noir, mm -hmm. this kind of lighter, fresher style. And this, for me, certainly falls in, in that bracket. Um, and I think because of it, it goes so well with this. Uh, I don't want to say a lighter dish because it's not a light shepherd's pie by any stretch. The flavours are exploding, oh, but texture-wise, it's light. You know, it's not chewy, it's not glycerol. You don't need to work through it like you work through tannins. It melts. And I think this wine does that as well. Um, I'll let you quickly mention the uh, vegetables because I did yes. sneak, a, sneak a taste of those first and then I'll go on to telling you who makes the wine and, and all of that sort of stuff. I have to apologise to one of your members yeah. who did not get their vegetables in the they, box. They, they got only one box. They, were, they ordered two boxes, so at least there are some vegetables to look into. But I'm very sorry and we will do something about it later. Mrs Diamond. Mrs Diamond actually that is, yes. So no diamonds in the bottle of white wine. But you have a Mrs. Diamond. And I'm really sorry. But it happens when we are packing so many boxes. Something happens. So these vegetables, uh, the idea is to keep them simple. And to not overpower the vegetables simply because we have a dish full of flavor. So it's just lightly seasoned with cumin seeds. So the cumin seeds are sizzled in a little bit of oil. The vegetables are blanched and just tossed inside. You might have a, a blend of... Um, mushrooms inside which are which are uh, from the new forest and uh, they are different they're completely different because there are five six different varieties i've cut up and put inside and the vegetables are actually very simple uh, the the red cabbage gives a certain hue to it gives a certain hue to it and uh, hope you enjoy it i mean it's simple but put it in a frying pan the oven will destroy your vegetables i think oh so see mine Mine were oven and mine are really good. The flavor is gorgeous. I love cumin and it's a, a, it can be a tricky thing to pair with wine, but I think a little bit of spice and a little bit of cumin with something fruity like this wine is really lovely. So mm -hmm. um, for me, it's, it's fabulous. Excellent. Good um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the wine for members who have it. Um, it is 100% Grenache or Garnacha. Um, so what you should expect in principle are, are sort of red fruits. Um, Toby has written here, and this is not a, a dissing of Toby's note at all, aromas of orange peel and rose petal. I think the chances are this wine has evolved a little bit since he wrote that note. I'm still getting something slightly floral, and I would say that it's um, coming out. It's one of those things often I find when I leave it longer in the glass, it comes out for longer. Um, but a member, a member wrote something. Um, I've lost it, but it says uh, something about it being smelling like a school library. And I totally understand what you're saying. There's something a little bit more developed now on the nose for me. I actually find it quite smoky. 
um, more smoky than I was expecting to find it and a little earthy and a little um, more tertiary. But certainly the, the bulk of it is about these red fruits, a little bit of pepper um, and something slightly floral. So all of those aromas for me work beautifully with the food. And then in terms of the, the um, structure of it, we've already mentioned that it's not particularly tannic. Now, there's a few reasons this is. Uh, one is, well, I'll tell you where it's from first, because that actually helps with the structure as well. It's produced by Quile, and um, Quile is actually from the Undaraga family. You may recognize the name Undaraga from Chilean wine. That was their original venture. Um, the three, three of the brothers have gone off to start Quile, and... Um, Cristobal, one of the brothers, is the head winemaker and the others are sales and management and, and amazing things. But Cristobal is a fabulous guy. And they bought this estate um, in the Alto Cochagua and they concentrate on red wine. They started in 2006 um, and they've built they've built this winery, but they also have um, invested in vineyards that are on altitude. And the reason I mention that is they're sort of 500 meters above sea level. And um, there's such a variation in the altitudes, that they can actually vary by two degrees from the bottom of their vineyards to the top of them. That's how, how um, much, should I say, elevation they have on their vines. And actually, even though they're in a warmer part lat latitude wise, the hottest average temperature they get is around 26 degrees in the summer. So it's really not too hot. And what that does is it provides acidity. It keeps well, it, sorry, it doesn't really provide acidity. It preserves acidity It makes sure that the grapes don't get too hot and therefore lose their acid. So exactly what Cyrus was mentioning about this sort of refreshing thing. Um, and then in terms of what um, what winemaking has influenced the style, it's been fermented in stainless steel. So you mentioned earlier, Cyrus, the oak not being a friend of spice in particular. It was fermented in stainless steel. They foot stomped it. So they did grape stomps, which is really quite rare. Um, you think that it's this common thing in winemaking. It's not. Um, and now it did spend 18 months in either concrete eggs or French oak, but they're foudre. And if anyone's ever seen a foudre, they're sort of multi-thousand litre huge oak barrels that don't really impart, impart any flavour and definitely don't add oak tannin. And actually what they end up doing is reducing the tannins. Um, so they allow the tannins to polymise. And so foudres tend not to influence the flavour so much as the structure. So you're not going to taste oak when you taste this wine. And this actually, this particular vintage, the 2018, is the first time they've ever taken the Grenache out of their blend. I noticed a member earlier said she was drinking the blend. They do produce a blend on this soil, the Cerro Basalto, but this is the first year they took the Grenache out and made a completely 100% uh, Grenache wine. It's organic, it's biodynamic, it's vegan, it's non-GMO product, it's all the things that sort of um, a brand new wine you might think might be, you know, they're not sticking to tradition here. They're really moving with the times, creating a slightly, it's not low alcohol. That's the only thing I would say. It's 14 and a half percent, but it's sort of lighter style, easier to drink, but still quality and packed with flavor, but not, um, yeah, like you say, not a kind of gutsy high doesn't taste high alcohol, but not one of those gutsy Grenaches that you think, oh, it overpowers. I think they work really well in harmony here, not only through flavor, but massively through structure as well. So I love that you picked this, Cyrus. And I remember because you were working through the wines sort of course by course or style by style. And you emailed me, at God knows what time of night, you'd obviously just tasted it. And you said, this wine is perfect. This is the one. So it was the, it, I kind of, was excited about trying it with this course and you, you certainly delivered. So thank It'll you. It'll be about one o'clock in the morning normally. <laughs> yeah, it was. I woke up sort of bleary eyed on my phone in the morning and I thought, oh, he's, ha he's happy about that one. So that's yeah. great. Um, lovely stuff. Right now, members, um, I asked Gil to amend the running order because I do appreciate we ran over slightly, but I, I certainly don't want to shorten anything that Cyrus has to say. Uh, so we're running five minutes over and I hope you don't mind. Um, those TV programmes will have to wait, <laughs> but you're obviously welcome to watch on Catch Up as well. But Gil, if you're happy to pop the slide up again, um, we've got the instructions for the next course. Yep. Um, 
Ooh, yep, just popping up now. And we're saying nine o'clock to give you enough time. We originally said 8.55, but we've pushed it back five minutes. So please do pour your uh, your hopefully chilled Napoleon Bonaparte five and prepare your pastel donata and your bibenka. And then we'll see you back again soon. See you soon. Cheers.
Hello, everybody, and a welcome back. Uh, I do hope that you've... My, my pudding's not arrived. My husband's going to be in trouble, but it will be here any moment. Um, I have, however, poured the wine, so I'm ready in that sense. And Cyrus, I have to say, um, I was so excited about the finishing off uh, my... Uh, country captain that I have actually dribbled it all down myself so oh, that's good that's a good sign good sign <laughs> it's a great sign isn't it I've good guzzled sign. it down and that's where oh. that's the way food should be enjoyed sometimes am I okay can you hear me yeah sorry I had a bit of an echo coming through there oh, but yeah. I'm all sorted now um but yes I've uh I've dribbled on myself out of excitement so there we go <laughs> now um I'm gonna obviously hold off enjoying my desserts until my husband brings them up to me but Cyrus I'd be very keen to hear your thoughts and so you could tell us a little bit about them. First of all that wine you don't share. <laughs> I would be very reluctant to share that wine with anybody. It, <laughs> it's not one of those heavy extra sweet very honeyed you know like an Auslese or a Trockenbeer Auslese. One of those is just so light and so nice. Actually, quite refreshing. So it's not absolutely th thick on the palate. The food on the other side, pastel and nata, everybody knows, I suppose. But some people have got four and some have got two. We have two sizes. I miscalculated the large ones. And so some people have been given two each of the smaller ones. Okay, so the, the bibinka, the bibinka is actually, they make a bibinka also in uh, the Philippines, but it's completely different because that's more like an egg custard baked on charcoal. This one is a more Portuguese influence. So it's like a coconut pancake, but it's baked layer upon layer. So you don't bake it all together. You pour a layer in a, in a tin, then you bake it. When it gets color on the top, you brush it with some butter, you pour the next layer on top. It takes about eight or nine hours to make, actually. So it's a very tedious process. It's a whole day process. And we have a square tin in which we make it. But it's a very long process. But it's rich, it's delicious, and not necessarily that sweet. It tastes good when it's slightly warm. And that's why I chose this wine, because you're getting a great wine with warm, hot dessert. One, of course, is an egg custard tart. So again, these tarts were not invented in Portugal. They were created in the colonies. The reason for that, and I'll just touch upon that tiny bit of history, is that when, the, when uh, Vasco da Gama had this vision of having a Vatican of the East in India, missionaries were taken from Portugal to convert the local people into Catholics. But all over the colonies, they took the missionaries. The nuns and the priests the monks had to starch their habits to look nice and fresh. And they had not come across different starches. So in the East, you use rice as a starch, use the water from the rice as a starch. And they had no concept of that. So they used to use egg whites. And they were left with tons and tons of egg yolks. They bred chickens everywhere. And they had lots of egg yolks. So all their desserts, a lot of the desserts were created out of egg yolks because they had a surplus of egg yolks. So egg yolk in the pastry, egg yolk in the custard, egg yolk in the pancake, egg yolk everywhere. And that's how it came about. So um, it's rich. Pastel Nata is rich. Those who've got the smaller ones lucky, you can keep two in the fridge and bake two and eat them today. Uh, the larger ones, of course, are very, very nice because you get a larger piece of the custard in it. And I think this particular wine, it just marries it so beautifully. I just love it. Southern Cape, yes, great. I think I'm sure it is picked at the end of summer, maybe, and end of winter, maybe. So the wines get a little bit more concentrated fruit. And um, they are great, but it's not so rich. It's not so uh, viscous. So I find some of the dessert wines very, very viscous. Absolutely. And I have to say, Cyrus, this is my first time ever trying Babinka. And it's got to be up there with one of my favourite desserts I've ever tasted. Um, for anyone who's not tasting along with the boxes uh, this evening, I would sh I'm going to pick it up with my fingers, and I hope you don't mind. But it's beautifully layered. You can see all of the individual layers. 
it's gorgeous and it's this lovely um light and i think one of the things that's coming through is that lovely tropical note yep and what i like that you've married in this wine um in particular is because this wine is produced with two different grape varieties so um it's a uh, then i should explain with starting with the name i suppose actually um it's uh the liberator actually i'll talk about the liberator in a moment because that's a whole different kettle of fish but napoleon bonaparte five part five is because it's the fifth time they've made a, a napoleon and i'll tell you about that in a second version of of wine um but napoleon was a big fan of sweet wines from the cape now they used to they used to um make these wines sweet um particularly so they would last on long journeys so it's it is a very sort of We've gone through a lovely story of commerce and, and history here. And this is a nod to that style. Um, if anybody's heard of Klein Constantia or Constantia Groot, that yeah. was Constantia Groot was the original. And it's a, a nod to that style because it was one of Napoleon's favourite wines. When he was exiled, he he had a, several casks of it or several, um, well, several, are they called tons? Sent over um, to drown his sorrows shall we say and it's a nod to that style on the nose for me there is one grape variety in here which is muscat which of course smells uh, you often hear people say muscat smells of grapes and this wine does smell of grapes that is absolutely fine if you smell it and you said smells of grapes great but there are so many other things in this as well um so for me there's a lovely dried apricot and dried peach um there's a bit of jasmine perhaps but there's also those tropical fruits. And I think particularly that's why this has worked so well for me. It's got sort of dried mango and dried pineapple. Um, and that's, yeah, that makes this marriage absolutely perfect. Um, but the other great variety in here is Shannon. And Shannon has a notoriously high acidity, 36% Shannon. So that refreshing sensation that you're talking about, Cyrus, that will come a lot from the Shannon. Um, but also from from how it's made. And I'll go into that in a moment as well. Um, in terms of sweetness, it's 160 grams per litre. So that's about the level of sweetness of a rich, rich sauterne. However, it is made differently. There are some similarities. So the similar main similarity is that it's made with noble rot. So um, botrytis cinerea affects the grapes and therefore you can... Um, you can physically see them shrivel on the vines. So Cyrus is quite right. You pick them later, you allow this rot to settle in and it does settle in and where, where this particular wine is made in the Pal region um, by a producer called Nederberg. And the, um, the grapes shrivel and what happens when they shrivel or you could call it raisining, but really it looks more like a moldy shrivel is a lot of the water is, is uh, evaporated. And so you get concentrated sugars and concentrated flavors. And actually even the rot itself imparts some of those more tropical flavors. However, a lot of sotan will then be aged in oak. We come back to it again, this oak aging. Um, this particular style was hand harvested, but then fermented in a cool, um, environment so cold ferment and then put through a separator so that the yeast was extracted so it didn't carry on fermenting when it got to the right alcohol and sweetness levels so it could have been it could have got sweeter is what i'm saying but instead they decided to halt the the conversion of sugars to alcohol leave some more sugar and leave 10 percent alcohol so they've kind of come into this sort of middle category of alcohol of sweet wines which i think works really well and then they've not really aged it. So they haven't, you know, spent ages putting it in oak or, or any of those sorts of maturation um, techniques. So instead you get this really young style. It's very fruity. It's very fresh. You've preserved all of those wonderful, um, lively components in the wine. Um, and for me, it makes it absolutely perfect with this, um, particularly the tropical notes, like I said. But the acidity from the Shannon really cutting through those sort of more egg based and the, the richer um, more glycerol kind of feeling in the mouth from the desserts are cut through by the acidity in here as well. So it's a lovely complement to each other. And I think the other thing that really helps for me is you want to drink this very cold. So you want to drink this straight out the fridge. And that helps to increase your perception of acidity. It doesn't really do anything to the actual wine in terms of science, but your perception of acidity is heightened when it's cooler. So you really feel like this is refreshing. And I think because these desserts are quite um, sort of summery and fruity 
um, it does mean that you you want something slightly lighter. Um, so fabulous, fabulous. And I did see somebody say pastel donatas are um, a house favorite. They're a house favorite for us as well. Um, we, if you do drink them in Portugal, they often have them with a tawny port for all of the reasons I've just said. So a tawny port will be lighter. It will be higher in acid. It won't be as sort of oaky agey. All of those explanations I've just given you why you would drink it with a tawny port chilled as well, rather than um, perhaps a, a vintage port or a crusted port, for example. Um, I'll just mention really quickly what the Liberator means, because I mentioned it at the beginning, because it's quite interesting. And you may have seen Liberator wines come up now and again. Um, but the Liberator is started by, and here comes the full circle back to the uh, MW, starting and ending with MWs. There's a gentleman we uh, often work with, but he's a South African expert called Richard Kelly. He's an MW and he, he has been living in South Africa for a while. He now lives in the UK, but um, he in particular has spotted that there's a lot of really good quality grapes and what or wines that would have gone into blends but perhaps don't and the South African market just sort of sits on them or they throw them away and they don't have a natural route into market as easily as say a French um I want, don't want to call them off cuts because that sounds a bit strange but a buyer used that expression to me the other day and I thought actually that's exactly what it is it's an off cut it didn't go into the original wine it might have been a barrel they were experimenting with or maybe they had too much of one of the components of a blend, so they had a bit of excess. And what Rick, or Richard Kelly, alias Rick, Rick goes and liberates these wines from South Africa. So this is actually an exclusive wine for us. Nobody else sells uh, part five of the Napoleon series, but you'll see that there are other liberator wines that come up on our website. And if you ever see them, it, they come from different wineries. So as I mentioned, this one's Nederberg. They come from different wineries. There's no rhyme or reason. One could be really expensive. One could be really cheap. Um, but they are wines that he's liberated that would have otherwise gone. Let's not even think about where this would have gone. It's too delicious, Cyrus, to even consider that it would have gone anywhere other than our glasses, right? Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I'm really glad you picked this wine. Um, it's been a pleasure to show it because I know um, a lot of members might look at it and go, oh, and a noble rot from South Africa with a name I don't understand, but hopefully um, some of you will have tried it and, and enjoyed it. So, yeah. um, yes. Yeah, it, mm. it is delicious. And at 10% alcohol, Cyrus, you'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> they say antibiotics are fine on 10% alcohol. <laughs> I don't know about that. I'm not going to throw it out. <laughs> Good answer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lovely. Well, I have to say a huge thank you, Cyrus. And before I thank you properly, we do have a poll. Um, I'm going to flash it up on the screen because we've asked members to choose their favourite food and their favourite wine combination. Yep. I yep. would like to know, whilst that poll is going up on the screen as well, Cyrus, I would like to know your favourite combination. Uh, for, for the food uh, today? Yes, for food. today. Uh, two, actually. Okay. The main and the dessert. Okay. The main and the dessert because the, the ganache is not an easy grape to work with. And it, I went through it three times before I said, this is wow. This has to work. And that's what I'm going to do with it. The sweet desserts and sweet wines are not an easy match all the time. Okay. This wine is great with cheese as well. And this wine is great with other things too. But I thought it was just that there was a little bit of acidity inside, which is uncommon with some of these wines. And that helped to just tone down the richness of the custard and the richness of the bibinka. And I thought that's going to work. That is going to work. So yes, across the board, I mean, the Pinot Gris was my favorite. Your Napoleon favorite wine. Number two in, in favorite. But at the same time, in terms of pairing, I thought the main and the dessert was uh, what for me just clicked like that. Brilliant. Thank you. And members, please do. We're so keen to hear your favorite pairings. Um, please do pop them. Uh, you it should have be up on your screen now. Cyrus and I aren't allowed to vote because we're panelists, which is a shame. But you've heard Cyrus says, so I'll tell you mine. Specifically, it's the Babinka and the Liberator. And I think part of that is the fact that I've never had a Babinka before. And, and it's, uh, 
I will never, ever not order it now if I ever see it on the menu. There's certain foods in the world that I must order if I see them. And that's now one of them. So that was a real pleasure. And knowing how long it takes to make, I'm, I'm thrilled that we could share that. Um, members, hopefully you voted. Fingers crossed. I bet there's been some arguments. Um, I think we're happy to share it now. And uh, I would also ask, ah, here we go. So the winning winning wine and exact food combo is the Grenache and the Country Captain. Yes. There but, you I go. Would, but I would say if you add, oh, it's not quite the same, but Kumu, the Kumu, the first course, has actually done well on both yep. the hummus mm. and the batatas moros. Yep. So that's quite interesting. I... I'm sad the Liberator and Babink hasn't got more votes, but there we go. Add one, add one on there for me. Um, and yeah, I'm really, really glad to see such a nice spread there. So thank you. Um, I've, got really one, <laughs> I've got one final request um, just to ask you, because we have had a couple of members who've asked about recipes. One member in particular, I think, cooked your country captain recipe from BBC Good Food. Yes. Um, is that very similar to the recipe we, we experienced this evening? Yes. I cooked that recipe on Saturday Kitchen soon after the lunch we did for Her Majesty. And that's on the BBC Good Food website. And please use that recipe because that recipe really, really works. Because it's for maybe a small proportion of lamb compared to us using 10, 10 or 12 shoulders at a time. So the combinations differ, but at home, that recipe works. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's going to be my new my new go-to. And uh, I've got a personal question. Can I freeze it, Cyrus, if I cook it? Yes. Yes, yes you can. <laughs> Just that's make sure you defrost it, defrost it gently. So into the fridge overnight and then into the oven. Thank you so much. Um, we have had a couple, a couple more questions that I'm going to be able to answer over email afterwards so I can get those at a later date. Cyrus, you've had such a long day and uh, I am so, so grateful for you to share your Friday evening with us, particularly having been unwell and had had a, yeah, a rather unusual Friday. So I will at this point um, raise a very large glass of uh, Liberator to you and to thank all you. the members who joined this evening, thank you as well. Mine's been liberated already. <laughs> <laughs> Is there none left for Pervin? Oh, yeah. Pervin's relaxing, you know. I know, I'll give her some. I'll, I'll share some with her. No, no, I don't get any. <laughs> you don't get any. I'm not, I bet I don't believe that for a moment. <laughs> well, please do relax. Thank you again, Cyrus, like I said. An thank amazing. You um, and thank you, members, for joining us. We hope that you'll join us again soon. And uh, I will definitely be kicking the country captain on Sunday. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Fantastic. All the best. Thank Have you. fun. Hope to see you all again. Take care. Bye-bye. Cheers.